It was the worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. A moment of reckoning within Israel. A moment of change. Some of the changes were entirely predictable. Increased fear, trauma, anger, military mobilization. But others, none of us could have foreseen. And it's not an exaggeration to say that Hamas succeeded in doing something utterly unprecedented, but not in the way you might think. So what happened? How did Hamas' attack on October 7th transform Israeli society for the better? If you're Jewish, Israeli, or just a responsible consumer of news, you might be howling with rage right now. Hamas changing Israeli society for the better by invading, murdering, torturing, raping, and kidnapping nearly 2,000 civilians? And I want to be incredibly clear. The October 7th attack, which you could also call a pogrom, a massacre, or an invasion, was absolutely unjustifiable. In a matter of hours, Hamas and Islamic Jihad terrorists murdered more than 1,400 people, over 1,000 of whom were civilians, including little children. Some were lucky and died quickly, Others suffered the kind of agony no sane person could imagine. But we don't have to imagine it. Hamas broadcast their crimes to the world. They used their victims' phones to live stream tortures that defy all laws of warfare and all mores of human decency. And when they were done, they carted off their prizes. More than 240 men, women, and children from 25 countries to be held captive in damp tunnels deep under Gaza. So close to their homes, and yet utterly unreachable. Anyone with a working moral compass has condemned this display of brutality and aggression. But the global Jewish community has seen it all. We've endured thousands of years worth of morally unjustifiable attacks. And in the ultimate act of resistance, we've done more than just survived. We've thrived. Now, in our darkest moments since 1945, Israelis and Jews around the world are demonstrating the kind of resilience that we never imagined we'd need again. In the words of Bob Marley, you never know how strong you are until being strong is your only choice. I wish we had another choice, but we don't. And in the midst of our fury and our grief, we are seeing the best of Israeli and Jewish society worldwide. This global outpouring of love, of unity, of resilience, of strength is all the more remarkable considering where we were on October 6. Let's rewind for a minute. Back before the rocket barrages, the paragliders, the horror we could not have imagined, back to the moment that Israeli society began tearing itself apart. It took five elections and three years, but Israel finally managed to put together a government in late 2022, a highly controversial government. Almost immediately, the fault lines in Israeli society deepened. They'd always been there. After the election, they grew into a seemingly unbridgeable chasm. For months, ordinary citizens protested the government. Others protested those protests. Members of the Knesset called each other out, trading barbs in the press and on the Knesset floor. Doomsdayers predicted the end of Israeli democracy, warned that our enemies were paying close attention, that our reputation for deterrence, our security, relied on internal unity. Reservists threatened not to show up for their military assignments, Netanyahu publicly fired his defense minister for speaking out about the security risk. The country seemed headed for disaster. Israel has been described, somewhat mockishly, as the world's most chaotic family reunion. It's a sentimental comparison, but there's truth to it. It is the living embodiment of the Jewish prayer for Kibbutz Galuyot, the ingathering of the exiles. For 2,000 years, Jews have been divided, scattered around the world. Israel united us at least geographically, if not politically. But on October 6, 2023, we were more divided than ever. And then came October 7th, when the real enemy showed us what it looked like to try and bring down a country. They bloodied us, it's true. We're bruised and battered and scarred. But they also brought us together. Yes, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad managed to do what the Israeli cabinet couldn't. Without intending to, they erased months of protests and infighting, bridging divides that had seemed intractable only 24 hours before. Call it trauma bonding. Call it arevut, the concept that all Jews are responsible for one another. Call it a natural response to an existential threat. I am seeing and hearing things that I could not have imagined. Displays of solidarity that would have once seemed outlandish unprecedented and heartwarming outpourings of generosity 
the kind of resilience that I'd read about in history books. There's this fact that I absolutely love. For two years after the Holocaust, European DP camps had the highest birth rates in the world. An entire generation of refugees, traumatized, orphaned, scarred, choosing life in the face of so much death. We are the descendants of those brave refugees. Their resilience and strength is encoded in our DNA. And whether we live in Israel or the diaspora, we are coming together in choosing life. For months, Israel buckled under the weight of increasingly angry protests against the government, led by a movement called Brothers in Arms. They blocked highways, they rallied inside Israel's single international airport, jamming traffic and causing major delays. They clashed with police. They even threatened not to show up to reserve duty, a cardinal sin in a country like Israel, where military service is almost sacred. <laughs> And then came October 7th. By October 8th, Brothers in Arms had transformed into Israel's largest aid NGO. They had all the infrastructure in place, volunteers, organizers, an understanding of logistics. For months, they'd been coordinating the movement of thousands of protesters. Now, they've turned their attention to the war effort. Their first order of business was instructing protesters to mobilize. This is not the time to take a political stance and refuse to show up to reserve duty. But plenty of volunteers are too old, too young, or too frail to be called up. And so every day, roughly 15,000 volunteers show up to help in whatever way they can. 15,000! In a country of 9 million, that would be like half a million Americans mobilizing as volunteers overnight. Some help organize meals, clothing, and lodging for the tens of thousands of Israelis who have been evacuated from their homes in Israel's north and south. Israelis are so eager to help that these slots are filled within minutes. Others ensure that soldiers are adequately prepared, organizing shipments of protective gear to the military. Animal lovers match orphaned or abandoned pets with new families. Therapists provide their services to traumatize survivors. Other jobs are a bit more grim. Engineers use AI to comb through hours of video, trying to figure out who has been captured and who has been killed. Not everyone volunteers through Brothers in Arms, though. Some just take it upon themselves to do what they can. Like this 82-year-old Holocaust survivor, Igor, who volunteered to iron uniforms for hundreds of thousands of soldiers who have suddenly been mobilized. Or these yeshiva students, who have taken time out of their studies to make tzitziot, religious garments that Jewish men wear under their shirts for soldiers who need them. Or the yeshiva students who heard that soldiers need flip-flops and pooled all their money together to get the best ones in town. Or these religious women, some Druze, some Jewish, who are cooking meals for people in need. Or the women who are donating breast milk to feed all the babies who were orphaned or whose mothers were kidnapped or called up. Or the citizens who stood in the sun for hours just to donate blood in the words of the director of the Jerusalem Blood Drive, look outside, the Sfaradim, Ashkenazim, all the citizens of Israel, every kind of Israeli that exists. Or the property tax collection division of the Tel Aviv municipality. Well, wow, that's a lot of syllables to say the people everyone hates because they call you to remind you to pay your property tax. Since the war began, they're making phone call after phone call, not to hound people to pay their taxes, no. They're calling to ask about their fellow Israelis' mental health, and it's all coordinated and approved by their bosses. I could go on all day, because even as our news feeds deliver update after update in a 24-hour reel, even as our hearts are broken, Israelis have mobilized to take care of each other in any way they can. That means all Israelis. Hamas rockets don't discriminate between Arabs and Jews. <laughs> In fact, when terrorists invaded southern Israel to burn and brutalize and slaughter, they made a point of murdering Israeli Arabs, who they see as traitors. I 
I won't pretend that there's no tensions between Jewish and Arab Israelis, that there's no racism or discrimination or pain. Those things exist, and they are terrible. But during a war, there are no Arabs and there are no Jews. There are only Israelis. Arabs and Jews were both brutally attacked. Now Arabs and Jews are fighting back, together. Israeli Arabs were among the first to run towards the carnage on October 7th, trying to save lives. Some survived, like Yusuf Ziadna, who jumped in his minibus towards the music festival where 260 people were slaughtered. He packed the bus to bursting, then navigated through back roads to avoid the terrorists who had taken over the main highway. Yusuf saved 30 lives that day, and he says he did it because he's a human being. We are all humans, and I have to save lives. Or Dr. Tariq Abu Arar, who paid dearly for his desire to help an injured man. On October 7th, the doctor was on his way to the hospital when he came across what seemed to be an accident on the side of the road. He didn't know yet that thousands of Hamas terrorists had poured into southern Israel to kill as many people as they could. So when he got out of his car to help, he wasn't expecting to be shot in the chest. But Dr. Abu Arar was wearing a bulletproof vest. Yeah, welcome to the Middle East. He survived the initial shot and told the terrorist he was Arab, a Muslim like them. They grilled him on the finer points of Islamic theology and then tied him to a pole and used him as a human shield to stop the IDF from striking from the air. For two hours, the doctor was forced to watch as terrorists fired into every single car that passed, murdering dozens of people. He was finally rescued by Israeli forces and treated for multiple gunshot wounds. Those scars will fade in time, but the nightmare of shooting after shooting that lives inside his mind, that is there to stay. And still, Dr. Abu Arar is lucky. He survived. Others didn't. Awad Dawarshe was only 23 years old, but he didn't think about himself when he raced to the music festival to treat the wounded. Awad was murdered while saving lives. I could keep going. But I'm going to choose to focus on the living on the things that you might not hear outside of Israel, like the story of Allah, who donated 50 bicycles to displaced kids from Israel's south, and who had his bike shop torched because of it. I'd rather focus on all the soldiers who are battling for their country. And who have a message for Hamas. These soldiers are Arab, Muslim, Christian, Circassian, Jewish, Druze, but above all, they're Israelis. And Hamas, if you're watching, they're coming for you. It's no secret that the military is one of Israel's most important institutions. And so it's probably not a surprise to hear that Israelis of all stripes are rallying around the 360,000 soldiers who have been mobilized since October 7th. Still, I could not have imagined the depth of their support. They came from all over the world, Lithuania, India, Brooklyn. I've been in Vietnam, and then I tried to find the fastest flight to Israel. Some of them were called up, rushing to the nearest airport with the Tzav Shmone in their hands. And some simply showed up. Where uh, you came from? I came from Brooklyn, New York. And why did you come to Israel? I came because my brothers already got called up to fight and I have to be here with them. But it didn't matter if they were part of the 360,000 reservists who had been called up or whether they arrived on their own volition. 24 hours after the massacre, the entire country had rallied behind the IDF. For the first time in Israel's history, a line of Haredi, or ultra-Orthodox men, streamed out of IDF induction centers. More than 2,000 Haredim demanded to join their brothers in the military. Yeah, big deal you might be thinking. The IDF drafts all Jews in Israel. 
doesn't it? Well, yes and no. See, David Ben-Gurion, the country's first prime minister, struck a deal with the Haredi leaders. He agreed that yeshiva students, i.e. guys who spend their days learning Jewish texts, wouldn't have to serve in the fledgling army. This agreement became status quo, and despite multiple attempts to integrate Haredim into the IDF, less than 1% of Haredi men enlist. Haredi make up 13% of Israel's Jewish population, and the lopsided enlistment stats have led to significant tensions within Israel. Hamas's attack on October 7th managed to do what decades of Israeli policies and proposals couldn't. It brought Haredim willingly to the IDF. The army told me if you bring 50, we'll open the unit. They asked for 50, I brought 450. More and more Haredi soldiers are encouraging their communities to join up, at least for the duration of the war. These messages are aimed at Haredi men, but don't think for a second that Haredi women are sitting out the war effort. The Iron Sisters operate out of the back of a wig store where they coordinate every single kind of support you can think of for both soldiers and civilians. They cook for soldiers or for families whose usual caretakers are on the front lines. They provide free childcare or housework. They match displaced Israelis with free housing. They teach children whose schools have shut down. They organize clothing drives for Israelis whose homes and possessions have been destroyed. They make Shiva calls. They visit women whose partners are on the front lines. And they do all of this free of charge. For 10 hours a day, these Haredi volunteers do everything they can do to support Israeli families, no matter their level of observance. But here's the thing that shocked me the most, that touched me, that amazed me, that I never could have predicted. Many Haredi communities, both in Israel and the diaspora, are non-Zionist. Some are even anti-Zionist. Now, I'm not talking about these whack jobs who get trotted out at every anti-Israel protest as token Jews. The Neturei Karta are a fringe group that even the staunchest anti-Zionist Haredim disavow. No, I'm talking about the Haredi communities who historically do not support the secular state of Israel, an objection rooted in religious tradition. These Jews believe that Israel should be a religious state, rising only when the Messiah arrives. The Zionist movement, they contend, had the chutzpah to both preempt the Messiah and establish a secular state on holy ground. As you can imagine, there's been a lot of tension between Haredi Jews who disavow Zionism while living in Israel and non-Haredi Israeli Jews, the vast majority of whom support the secular character of their country. These tensions have sometimes turned ugly. <laughs> הבוקר בעוד השרון קיבלנו עדות נוספת לשסע בין חילונים לדתיים בישראל. יונתן הירש, תושב העיר, הותקף מילולית, בידי נוסעת בשל זהותו החרדית. אני במדינת ישראל מתבייש ללכת עם כיפה ועם פאות, למה? מה קרה? את תחי איך שאת רוצה. חרדים are not a monolith, but I didn't expect to see a Haredi wedding featuring an Israeli flag. I could not have dreamed that I would see Haredim dancing in the streets when the IDF rescued Ori Megidish, a young female soldier kidnapped by Hamas and held for weeks. I never expected to see Haredim and secular Jews dancing hand in hand to celebrate the IDF's military achievement. The times, they are changing. And the changes go in both directions. When a secular Israeli news anchor heard about Ori's miraculous rescue, he asked for his co-host Yamaka so he could say the blessing for the ransoming of captives. Yeah, turns out there's a blessing for that. Survivors of the massacres in the South have publicly pledged to strengthen their religious observance. And when the Israeli soldiers came to rescue the survivors of the slaughter, they announced themselves by shouting the ancient prayer, Shema Yisrael, a mark of Jewish identity echoing over millennia. So many Israelis have responded to the massacres by turning towards the light. And there are so many sources of light in the darkness. Acts of kindness, volunteering, religious observance, educating yourself and others, and above all, spreading love. Because nothing screams, I choose life, like celebrating love. Couples who plan their weddings for months are not only going ahead with the festivities, they're doing it on their army bases, dancing in their uniforms. They're proposing to one another, making plans for the future. They're even matchmaking in the midst of war. 
One actress is even pushing out photos in short bios of soldiers in uniform, inviting her half a million Instagram followers to DM her if they want to be set up. Even Israel's former prime minister is planning Yenta, posting photos of soldiers on his Twitter feed with captions like Tomer is currently single. In the midst of suffering, of grief, of unimaginable loss, Israelis are choosing life. They're celebrating bar mitzvahs, they're welcoming new babies and naming them in honor of the dead. Like baby girl Be'eri, named for the kibbutz where Hamas terrorists tortured and slaughtered 112 people and kidnapped another 50. Kibbutz Be'eri has been destroyed, its babies murdered. But baby Be'eri, born five days after the massacre, is a symbol of rebirth. <laughs> It's a heavy responsibility for a little baby to carry, but it's a responsibility that all of us share. Because there is no better example of defiance than choosing life, no better resistance than spreading light, no matter how we choose to do it. This unity extends well past Israel. Hamas's war crimes have exposed the deep anti-Semitism that infects much of the world and brought together Jews and allies like never before. Whether it's the German Vice Chancellor, the Gründung Israels war danach, nach dem Holocaust, das Schutzversprechen an die Jüdinnen und Juden, und Deutschland ist verpflichtet zu helfen, dass dieses Versprechen erfüllt werden kann. Das ist ein historisches Fundament dieser Republik. Or Asida Kanko from the European Parliament advocating for human rights in the face of the Hamas attack. Do you remember history? Do you remember what happened on European soil? Do you want anything like that to happen again? Or the mayor of New York telling Jews and Israelis around the world. I'm here today to say not only am I the chief executive of this city, but I'm your brother. I'm your brother. In a world that is increasingly hostile to Jews, we welcome all expressions of support from our allies. But it's the love and support that we show each other that gives me the most strength. Maybe you remember the headlines from 2018, 2020, 2021. There was a new coldness in the relationship between the Jews here in Israel and the Jews abroad. A growing distance between the diaspora communities who had once been Israel's strongest supporters. For in many ways, those two parts of me, the American Jewish and the Israeli, are moving apart. And in many ways, they are becoming irreconcilable and even mutually antithetical. Before October 7th, liberal Jews around the world were growing increasingly worried about, well, basically everything to do with Israel. Its hardline government, its military policies, its settlement expansions, its proposed judicial reforms. All of that has been set aside. Our home is on fire. And Jews around the world are rushing to help. They've rallied in England, in Chile, in Canada. They've put up billboards in religious communities, urging commuters stuck in traffic to take the opportunity to pray for their fellow Jews. They've come to college campuses to sing with and comfort Jewish students who have been threatened and assaulted by their peers. They've plastered hostage posters on lampposts and trees and utility poles, reminding every one of the Israelis who have been unjustly stolen from their homes. They've set up installations across the world, Shabbat tables with 240 empty seats, one for each hostage, Empty strollers, teddy bears, eyes and hands bound, spray painted red with blood. A reminder of what the hostages suffered on October 7th, what they might still be suffering now. It's a dare to the rest of the world. Just try to look away. We're not forgetting, neither will you. So while our news feeds show us the kind of hatred we thought we'd left behind in the 20th century, they're also trumpeting our love for one another. It's the kind of love that transcends everything bridging gaps that once seemed insurmountable. The love between family. 17 years in the army, I never saw a difficult situation like the situation we're in now. But what matters now is that we're together. post Chazak, on the Achtos like this. On October 6, we were divided, squabbling at each other's throats. By October 8th, we became, once again, the Israelis who built a country who brought a Jewish commonwealth back to life after 2,000 years of exile, who fended off the enemy time and time again. These are two leaders of Israel's opposing protest movements who spent months mobilizing thousands of Israelis for two opposing causes, 
Today, they stand arm in arm, united under the same flag. Categories like religious, secular, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Arab are melting and mingling. In their place is a unified identity and a shared goal, the survival of our homeland. Will this unity last after the war ends? Will we treat each other more kindly, more lovingly, more empathetically, as each of us learns to live under a mantle of grief? Will we remember the beauty of this moment when we banded together and chose life? I hope so. I'd like to believe that we will. This is the secret to our survival through pogroms and expulsions and genocide. And this is why we have been able to say, despite everything, that Am Yisrael Chai, the people of Israel, live.